we, we don't really mean what we say. We're really just talking and we're not really interested in the action. No, we very much want you to join an organization that is working for justice, because even if you join an organization that is not with the party because you are not African identifying, if you start or join any organization, that means that we are mobilizing one by one. Why is that important? That is important because that's how we build this collaboration to work with our allies. That's how we build this collaboration to have strong solidarity. And most importantly, that's how we deconstruct capitalism. So if you ask yourself, Shukura, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to deconstruct capitalism, but that cannot be done on an individual level. It can't be done with three people. It can't be done with 500 people. We need a mass movement, you all, a mass army, a mass of people to make that happen. So that means that we need you to be as healthiest as you can be, mind, body, and spirit. And so however you need to take care of yourself, please do that. But we thank you for joining us today. So on that note, I'm actually going to start out with an antidote story that we have actually shared on the seminar before in a different space, because I want to help paint a picture as I continue to talk to all of us. But this slide especially is dedicated to our European allies. So I just want to talk to you all for a moment as humbly as I can just to help you understand why this story is connected to what I would ask of you as a party, a par as a party member, but also as a person in the struggle, um, if you are interested in stepping in and if you do identify as an ally for people of color and oppressed peoples. So, gosh, I can't even remember how long ago it was, Daddy, but I think it was uh, probably within the last six years, we went to Alcatraz for on Thanksgiving to support our indigenous brothers and sisters. And later that day, we learned about an action that was taking place at the BART Fruitville uh, station in uh, either Richmond or Oakland overlap city limits. So for those that are familiar with the Bay Area, you know that that is where um, Oscar uh, Grant was brutally murdered. And for those that don't know, there was um, unfortunately a, a Hollywood action movie that was made based off of his death. And so Michael B. Jordan played his character. I'm not telling you this so you can watch the movie. I'm telling you this because we decided to go to this action at this BART station where this brother was killed because we were trying to pay homage, give support and respect to his family and figure out a way to mobilize and organize with other African people who were clearly hurt and were um, trying to figure out how to heal in that space where this brother had been murdered, okay? So we arrived, parked the truck and walked over to the station. And I immediately noticed, um, my apologies, before we walked over to the station, we actually met maybe about a mile or so away with a group of people and they asked us to all wear white. And so for those that don't know, white is usually in the African community and other communities a sign of unity, okay? So we all wore white and tried to show our solidarity. So we showed up. There was drumming, there was dancing, music, because we were calling on the ancestors. We did a libation. Again, if this is unfamiliar terms to you, a libation is where you uh, pour out some type of liquid uh, because you are using that liquid as a way to connect with mother nature and mother earth. And really you're connecting with the ancestors and the spirit. So I know it's very popular in the indigenous culture. It's also very popular in the Af African culture. And so the idea is you're literally bringing the ancestor spirit to you wherever you are pouring this liquid. So yes, you, you've seen it done in the Friday movies where the brother will have some type of alcoholic beverage and pour it out and say, this one is for my homies. But you may have also saw it with someone who has a bottle of water and pours it into a plant. And usually what happens is after you call someone's name, you say some type of term, Rudiana or Ashe or something that just means, and so it is. And then it is assumed that that spirit and that presence is with you. So we had dancing, we had drumming, we had a libation where we called on the ancestors and we were rallying up you all basically to go together so that we could walk to the station. So I'm saying all that to say, after we had our energy collect collected and we saged the area and did what we needed to do, then we started walking as a unified front to the BART station. And once we got to the BART station, we stayed on the lower level ground. We never took the stairway up. We never went and elevated up, but we stayed on the ground where the parking lot was. And what I immediately noticed was there was a space, an inner circle, if you will, of African people. Some were dancing, some were drumming, some were uh, chanting and calling on ancestors and whatnot. And there were Europeans that were there. There were Europeans there wearing white. There were Europeans there that were not wearing white, but they were definitely there because they were trying to show support and acting as solidarity, solidarity people in that space. I remembered hearing someone who had a bullhorn say, you know, 
I'm asking anyone who is not African identifying, and they use the term black, but of course we use African here. So anyone who is not African identifying, can you please step outside of the inner circle? So please do not cross the inner circle. Can you please step back, step outside of the inner circle? And I heard that be repeated a couple of times. It, it seemed like maybe once every 10 minutes, I heard the bullhorn person say that again. And so it occurred to me that as African people, we were literally trying to acknowledge to the Europeans that were there, we so appreciate you all being here, but we need you all to give us space because we are broken and hurting right now. And we don't necessarily need you to come in on our space. And so that's the, the, the gist of the story. So I guess if you're a European, then you might ask yourself, why, why does she tell that story? What does that have to do with me? I understand personal space. I understand how to respect space. I, I'm not so sure if that's really a conversation that I can necessarily have with you, but I'm going to humbly try my best to explain to you all today that what we're asking you to do, if you truly are interested in being in solidarity with us, means that you're going to be required to feel uncomfortable at times. And what I mean by that is we're asking you to be okay with feeling uncomfortable at times, because if you truly behave as an ally for oppressed people, then that means you concede to showing a sense of support and not making it about you, which ultimately means you're resisting European or white fragility. That means you're resisting European or white supremacy. That means you're resisting the idea of the natural socialization that we all have been taught. And so I think me bringing up that story is a case in point to help you understand. I think Europeans naturally moved into that inner circle going back to my story because they too were in pain. They too were hurting. They too were disgusted and outraged and angered and trying to figure out what they can do. They were probably sick of other African men and women identifying and non-binary Africans being murdered and slaughtered and they were trying to do something. So they showed up at the BART station and they were ready to take an action. And we applaud that and we are grateful for that. But that also means that you're still putting yourself in the center forefront. And that's what I'm asking you to be critical about and to really think about is how can you be an ally but still not be the center of attention? How can you be an ally and allow us to maybe kind of organize ourselves first and then maybe you can figure out how you can still assist with that and what that might look like for you. So we're asking you to purposely go against the grain. This type of conscientiousness requires such a deep understanding of emotional intelligence and social awareness. It also means being a worker who is actively working against not just white supremacy and European supremacy, but also using your positionality to understand that if you support oppressed people not being oppressed, then that doesn't just mean supporting them from their racial barriers, so racism and white supremacy. That means you're also working actively to work against patriarchy. And how does patriarchy affect oppressed people? Well, it actually affects them very much. And as my dad has said before, patriarchy actually existed in Africa way before the colonists went there and kidnapped Africans and way before other Africans had Africans as slaves, okay? So when we're asking ourselves, what type of oppressions need to be eradicated? Well, we have to start with patriarchy because that's the forefront that pretty much was a brother and a sister to capitalism, okay? So if we're gonna continue on and think about all these systems that need to go, patriarchy is one of them. And so I would still challenge you to think about how can you use your European identity to resist patriarchy as much as you can, whether you identify as non-binary, as a man identifying or as a woman identifying, how are you using your positionality to resist that? Because that's still a system of oppression that is still hurting people of color. And then I wanna to try to give you some tools if I can, just to kind of help it all make sense to you. So I'm asking you to resist, I'm asking you to resist not just systems such as European or white supremacy, but also patriarchy. And then you're, you might be asking me, okay, yes, I, I resist that every day. Maybe I journal, or maybe I go to BLM movements, or maybe I write poetry about how I'm resisting. Whatever your action is for how you're resisting, you still might be asking me, Shukura, how can I help? Well, the step one, believe it or not, is the same line we say every Sunday. The step one would be, we, we need you to help us by actually joining an organization that organizes other European people. So I think that's what, if the party had been in charge of that action that took place at the BART station, I think that would have been the party's response to the European people who were coming into the inner circle, as we would have said, we appreciate you all being here, but 
are you here with another European organization? Are you here with other European allies? Where are the other European allies? How can you get them to come out to this action and not cross this inner circle? Because we need you as a European identifying person to organize other European identifying persons. That would never be my position. That would never be my ability to do that because that's out of my jurisdiction. I have no place to do that. And that's not appropriate for me to do that. And I'm going to talk in just a second about what I need to be focusing on. So that's why I need you to take on this toll and this task, because this is what I need European identifying people to do. Now, this is going to this ask holds a lot of weight for European people. Me asking you to join an organization that works actively to organize other Europeans. That's that's asking a lot of you, because sometimes when we work with our own kind, it shows us the ultimate challenge. So that means helping to debunk and demyth some of those uh, European conspiracies who really think that white supremacy is the way to go. They really think that it's appropriate to have this white supremacist idea because they're okay with it, it functions for them. I, I'm asking you to challenge some of that in a very safe way where you're not putting yourself at risk or maybe you're okay with agitating the system and putting yourself at risk. But that's what I'm asking you to do. And that, as I said, is a big ask, I understand that. Um, I know that it's a lot to, to deal with, and that's why I'm also encouraging you to have patience with yourself and have patience with other Europeans during this process, because it's not going to change overnight. That's one thing work study has taught me is that we're so agitated and so fed up with the system that we want change right away. But that never was the case ever throughout history. Things always took time because you had to be strategic and methodical so that you could be organized about it. So I would ask you to be patient with yourself if you truly are an ally and you truly are an organization that organizes other Europeans. And that means also being patient with the process as a whole. Just like the line we push in the party, we need all people to be organized. So that starts with having a PE list. It starts with having shared readings so that you can have discussion-based conversations with others in this organization. And then you all are reading the same material so that you can develop a dialogue on that discussion of the text. And then that also means, you know, staying connected to your goal of what you and other European organizers define as a decent ally. How do you define that? And making sure you stick to that goal, no matter what happens, no matter what someone says, no matter how much emotion you try to keep out of it, staying focused on what the priority is. And if the priority is being in solidarity, then that means not letting other things get in the way of that. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm speaking to African people. So first and foremost, organization decides everything. You also can help us by joining an organization that organizes other Africans. This is ask is a lot of you as well, because as I just said, sometimes working with our own can be a challenge. So I would encourage Africans to have patience with themselves as well and other patients, uh, other patients with other Africans. And I would also encourage us to understand when we join an organization like the party and we join work study, it's actually a very methodical process. And so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what that looks like in just a moment. But I want us to understand that having this political education, this PE list that I just referred to, is based on understanding how things have happened with our ancestors. So our ancestors can paint a picture for us and kind of draw a map, if you will, on how they navigated doing things. That means we're going to be understanding what things were like for them and how they chose to go about making the decisions they made that led to where we are today. So I would encourage us to, again, share readings with one another and, and have assigned readings that we all can complete together. That's what we do in work study. We all have the same reading list that we use and we have um, very real, realistic goals on how to read a certain page per capita for each weekend that we're meeting or every other weekend or whatever the work study meeting consistency is. And then from there, you're able to uh, build discussion questions based on the uh, length of reading that you were supposed to complete by said meeting. And that allows you to discuss with the other people in the work study circle what you thought about it based on the person's discussion questions. Or sometimes you don't have one person creating the discussion questions. You might have the collective creating the discussion questions. And then you just discuss based on what you can contribute based on how you understand things. It's okay if you don't have the same uh, walk away uh, comprehension as someone else. That's the whole purpose of that is for you to kind of be uncomfortable of not really understanding everything. The latest reading that we did was linen. And I gotta tell you, it was very, very heavy for me to read. And some of, some of my colleagues in work study shared the same sentiment. So no one said just because you're in work study, you have to understand linen or, or marks when you're reading these pieces. Sometimes they can be very hard for you to digest. But again, that's the beauty of being in work study and, and having PE at your side 
is you can be vulnerable with other people and talk about how this was really difficult for me. I did the best I could to read it, or this was really easy for me. I had no problem reading it or whatever, something in between and how that looks, okay? All right, so on that note, I want us to think about, ask yourself at any point in history, if you are African identifying, I want you to ask yourself this, at any point in history was anything ever accomplished without organization? Just think about that for a second. And I'm talking about quality, active actions that helped oppressed people have less ability to be oppressed. I'm not talking about like nonsense that occurs with people who don't care about collectivism or socialism. That's not what I'm talking about. So if you're thinking about any example that I can lay out for you in just a second, then you know the answer to that question is no. Organization decides everything. Organization helps our African ancestors now to this day um, since the beginning of time fight with colonists who were trying to run them out of countless countries in Africa. So their ability to be organized allowed them to fight against colonists. Organization helped Cuba, our, our sister country or brother country in many ways. And it also helped countries in South Africa, South America, sorry, helped to fight off colonists. When we think about organization, we need to remember if you're more, more uh, aware with history that took place in the United States. If you think about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, organization was the driving force that helped them operate many, many, many actions based out of the Mid-South. But the, the biggest one that comes to my mind for now is the Montgomery Bus Boycott, along with helping Africans register to vote. SNCC was very big and prominent with that. And organization was a key found factor for that. And then finally, if you wanna take it back to when we first came to be disseminated everywhere, you can think about how organization helped our African ancestors plan their escapes, as well as build up community events, like having church in the woods or creating our escape plan meetings, where we would meet in the middle of the woods and have sheets around us that were dipped in water so that the water could drown out our voices so that the master couldn't hear us talking. You know, you have to be able to really understand how methodical we had to be with that, which means we had to rely on organization to do that. And I don't just mean like being organized, I mean being a part of a working force that is based on some type of PE to help us understand what needs to be done. So joining an organization means building a process where you become critical and develop an analysis for concepts. That means you might be unfamiliar with something. And I was just talking about this uh, just a moment ago. So you can use your unfamiliarity to bounce ideas, ask questions to other people, get clarity, develop a discipline and become more comfortable with taking on roles such as taking minutes, uh, collaborating, sharing ideas, and most importantly, facilitating to make sure your voice gets heard. The second point I wanna make, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to my dad, is I wanna make sure Africans understand that we have a responsibility to understand that collective unity with allies is really the best option that we have at this point. I don't want Africans to think that we don't need help from anyone else. Yes, the first step is always that we need to organize ourselves. So that's the recommendation I gave in the previous slide to the Europeans. But if you heard me, I said the first step. I didn't say that was the only step. There's definitely more steps. We need allies. Think back to what we've learned from our brothers Kwame and Fidel Castro and their allyship. Or think about our brother Che Guevara and his brave alliance and allyship when he worked to fight against the threat of the colonists in another African country. Our brave sister Marilyn Buck, and how she assisted Asada Shakur for wrong for being wrongfully accused of framing of, of killing a police officer and framed for murder. My apologies. And then last but not least, think about the Quaker houses. Again, if you take it back to our ancestors who were enslaved, think about those Quaker houses and how when slaves were escaping, they knew what certain houses had a certain type of lantern. And if they had that lantern, then they knew they could go to that house and hide out as the overseer was coming to look for them. So these are all examples of what allyship and solidarity has looked like. And throughout time, we've learned that we cannot do this alone. It behooves us to engage with other oppressed people. Why? Because sadly, they understand some form of system that exploits them, just like Africans understand how colonists have stolen and exploited us. So we must welcome anyone interested and invested enough in the struggle to do some type of research, which means joining an organization that can provide them with some PE, allies with PE at foundations, because they understand the significance. It also means that they're more likely to have studied past collaborations with allies so that they can use those principles taught by the ancestors to keep the struggle alive. Thank you all so much. Thank you, birthday woman. Appreciate that. That's a an outstanding foundation for 
you know, the rest of what we're going to talk about here. Um, really appreciate it. And now we're going to move to talking about what does principled solidarity look like? And I have a few pictures here that I think really do a good job of illustrating it here. The picture is uh, the trial for wounded knee. Um, the American Indian Movement uh, went into wounded knee in 1972 and stayed there um, as a result of a uh, systemic oppression in that area of South Dakota. And they, they were there because it's their land and they were there several months and many people came to engage in solidarity. And so this picture is Dennis Banks on the right, um, who was on trial there um, along with Russell Means and William Kunstler, the attorney in the middle and then Kwame Ture is there on the left. Um, we would send people constantly for those trials, the trial of Leonard Peltier and you know other, other activists in the indigenous community who were being railroaded by um, the United Snakes government. So what is principal solidarity? So, you know, looking, building on the foundation that Shakura gave us, uh, we have to go back to this question of political education because one of the biggest problems that you see today is that everybody will rise up and, and say things like Black Lives Matter or Stop Asian Hate or whatever, you know, saying people are saying. And, and all those things are, of course, African lives need to matter. Of course, we need to stop Asian hate. Of course, indigenous lives need to matter. No question about any of that. Um, if you question that, you're just in the wrong place here. But we have to be able to go much deeper than that. And what we've experienced is like using the Black Lives Matter chant, for example, a lot of people, say that but the same people saying that don't know anything about african people nothing about our history our culture our the political oppression that we experience or even just our humanity as human beings nothing don't know anything don't even know you know about our our artistic development nothing about us as a people so the point of centering the work you're doing in political education is that how are you really truly to the soul going to support a people in a movement that you don't know anything about? You know, you're saying Black Lives Matter. If you don't know anything about the people, you don't have a foundation for the people themselves, not just a chant, but the people, then anything can come along and derail you um, from what you thought you intended with the chant in the first place. And if we look at it, we see that happening very much. You know, Black Lives Matter can mean anything. It can mean anything from we need to stop the police from killing us in cold blood to we need to figure out how we can make some money off of that chant and everything in between. And a lot of the reason for that is that the concept is not at this point rooted in a political education standpoint. And, and if you don't understand what I mean by that, just think about it like this. If you've gone to protest, right? Someone gets shot and you go to a protest, wonderful thing. But you didn't think much about, well, what are we gonna, what are we gonna leave this protest with? Like, what's the end action here? You think about that because most of that is based on spontaneous emotion. So like Shakur said, there isn't a lot of organizing work taking place there. It's a complete mobilization effort, which is great, but we need to move to the point of, what are we doing what we're doing in order to do? What are we trying to get with the work that we're doing? What, what do we want to end up with? How do we step up the ladder? How do we increase um, our capacity to fight? So the political education is the process that provides us the toolkit to engage, develop that analysis, and then figure out how to do the work to bring it into, ex into existence. So that's why we're constantly talking about that because we're not constantly doing it. And until we do it, we're going to continue to stay in this perpetual circle where something happens, the capitalist system does something to oppress us, we rise up and react to it. And as Kwame Ture used to say, we rise up, burn the city down, and then sit down for 29 years until the next time it happens. And this will never move us past this point. What moves us past this point is understanding that organization is the weapon of the oppressed. 
And so with that, you have organization and strong political education structures, not just studying books, but having strong criticism, self-criticism as a practice, an institutionalized practice, as well as democratic centralism as a decision-making process. And if you have that, then it's gonna become a requirement that you learn who you are. You study who you are and you understand who you are. And once you begin to understand who you are, that's gonna naturally make you want to respect and understand who other people are. And so then you begin to get the knowledge about not only your own struggle from your own community, but other communities. And then you can be on the pathway to learn how to approach those struggles from a principled standpoint that doesn't, as Shakura said, center you, but centers the people who the oppression is being aimed at. So I'll give you a quick example. Yesterday, I was invited to a meeting. Um, an indigenous elder here has uh, made their physical transition. And I was invited by um, people who are involved in the community around indigenous organization and rights. And they invited me there because they, I'll just say they wanted to have um, someone who could help develop and sustain a security presence. And so we went through, you know, what we needed to go through. And then when it was over yesterday, you know, they were saying to me, all the youth that were there, you know, we really thank you for coming because I was the only African, I was the only non-Indigenous person there. They were like, we really thank you for coming. And I said, no, you don't need to thank me. I thank you for letting me stay here 528 years. And everybody laughed, but, and it, you know, I mean, I, it, humor is always good in this work, but I was 100% serious. Like, I don't have, I, you know, they were like, can you do this? I'm like, I came here to do whatever you all need me to do, you know, and that's it. That's all I said in the meeting, those two things, because it's not about me. It's about me showing up there to support and provide that strong level of camaraderie there. So it's not about me. It's not about, and, and you know, we'll get to like some of the other contradictions because I already know what people are saying when, when we say that, well, when are they ever going to show up for us? Well, that's, you know, that's another part of the discussion because, you know, organizing work, the purpose of it is when you're engaged in that kind of work, you're going to, by virtue of the work, build relationships with other communities. That's just what's going to happen. It doesn't have, even if you don't do anything, even if you're not conscious of it, that's what's gonna happen. And so when that happens, what you'll find is that you'll begin to develop these relationships. Like when, when Black Lives Matter marches happen, it's not just African people that show up, it's all kinds of people that show up. You know, here in this town, they had the indigenous people, to, our, our um, indigenous Latino family members, they did a lowrider procession for Black Lives Matter here with the low riders, they had like 30 low riders here in Sacramento and they did a percent, they had all the signs, Black Lives Matter. They had all the signs, Chicanos for Black Lives Matter. We were, we were standing there, we were almost in tears. So that's, um, you know, that's how that looks, you can't help. And so of course we go over and talk to the folks and we introduce ourselves and you build camaraderie. That's how that, there's no way that's not going to happen. So when people say, well, when are people going to be there for us? That's because you're not engaged in the work. You're not having the type of experience I just had. So you're not building those relationships and understanding that it's always, always has been and always will be a reciprocal relationship. So that's what happens when you're engaged in that type of organizing work. And then that consistent work, you know, again, coupled with that strong political education foundation, you know, increases that deeper level of consciousness, right? And it helps you understand what your healthy and proper role is, right? Like when I was with the uh, indigenous people yesterday, they were in a, a, a long discussion about DQ University. And if you don't know about DQ University, it was the first indigenous university um, in these parts, and it's it's still here. It, it exists 20 minutes from where I live, outside of the University of California at Davis, and it it's been there for decades. And it you know the the university was 
was founded because of the treaty that called for all the abandoned military bases and prisons to be turned over to the indigenous people. But of course, like all the hundreds of treaties they made with the indigenous people, they broke each and every one of them. And so these folks went on there and just started this university way back in the 1970s and 60s or 70s. I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure offhand when, but that's when it started. And so they've been there ever since, and it's been a real struggle. And so they were having an intense conversation about it. And they were like wanting to make sure that I didn't feel uncomfortable. Like, and I told them, no, I know the history of DQ. We've studied it in the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We've done many events out there. In fact, when Dennis Banks was chancellor there in the early 80s, we went out there and did security for him at the request of uh, DQ University and the American Indian Movement. So we, yeah, we have a strong understanding of DQ University. And then as soon as I said all that, then I could sense their energy towards me. Like this, this brother knows, yeah, he's here. He, this is respect. So then now they open up to me. You see what I'm saying? So this is how you build this kind of relationship through this kind of principle solidarity. Now, if I'm just there and I'm sitting there and I'm just eating the food and then and, and they're talking and I'm like, Indian lives matter, Indian lives matter, but I don't know anything about them. They're asking me like, hey, you know, you know about DQ? University? No, I don't know nothing about that. But Indian lives matter. Well, do you know about land rights? No, I don't know nothing about that. I'm an American, but Indian lives matter. Then, then that's when people look at you like, yeah, I mean, you're just on some, all you're trying to do is feel better about whatever you feel bad about. You don't really even see us as human beings. So that's what Shakura was referencing when, she talked about how, you know, a lot of times, you know, European people show up at, at our stuff and they have good intentions, but you know, the saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That, sorry y'all, that's not enough to have good intentions. You gotta be willing to do the work. And if you're not willing to do the work, then you're not really serving a purpose that helps us. And so the reason why we need and we want and here again, you have you have a picture of a because you know I I hear African people all the time. Well, there's nobody comes to our solidarity. Well, again, and I tell them, well, the reason why you don't know that because to you, our African liberation movement consists of whatever is happening in your living room and your bedroom in your head. You're not involved in any real work. So whatever is in your living room and bedroom is what's in the movement in your in your mind. So I guess in your mind, a couch or a TV is the movement. I don't know, but you don't, you're not involved in real work. So you don't understand everything I just got through talking about. So I show these pictures in the hopes that it helps counter these reactionary narratives. And here you have, you know, indigenous people um, talking about black lives in solidarity and doing that. Because again, you know, when you go to, and I know we sent party delegation to Standing Rock in 2006, there's all kinds of people that come out because people instinctively want justice. But just showing up, like people say, well, just show up. Yeah, that's, that's the bare minimum. We have a lot more we have to do beyond just showing up. And we really want to have principled solidarity. And we need to have it because there are no isolated victories. There's no such thing as us as African people getting Pan-Africanism without the victories of other oppressed communities. Anybody that thinks that is a fool and doesn't understand what's happening in this world and how things change. Because the only way that we will win our struggle is with imperialism being weakened. And so the stronger the indigenous people are in fighting US capitalism and imperialism throughout the Western hemisphere, that helps our work in liberating Africa. That's even a five-year-old can understand that logic. There's no question about that. So of course, uh, it makes common sense for us to support the struggle of the indigenous people in the Western hemisphere. The only reason why you would not do that is because you're centering yourself. And I hear Europeans say this, well, if the indigenous people get their land back, what happens to us that are here? Who the hell cares what happens to you? You gotta figure that out. It may be if you engage in the proper work that you're supposed to be engaging in, you will have a place with the indigenous people here when they win. They have never, I've never heard them say that you can't be here. So why are you centering yourself? Get to work and then you don't have to worry about that because people will want you around because you will be an asset to humanity. 
So that's why that's very important. There's no way that the Palestinians winning against Zionism, which is a chief appendage of imperialism, doesn't strengthen our movement. And there's no way that our work to achieve one unified socialist Africa doesn't help all of those movements, doesn't help the Irish. There's no way the Irish can become free from British imperialism and we don't benefit from that because the only way that happens is imperialism has to be weakened. And if imperialism is weakened, it's not just going to be weakened to benefit the Irish, it's going to be weakened to benefit the Africans. It's going to be weakened to benefit the indigenous people, the Palestinian people, the Filipino people, all the people who are struggling against imperialism. So there are no isolated victories. And anybody that sees it like that, like we can just be free on our own and we don't have to pay attention to anything else, then that's somebody that's not seriously understanding what it takes to be free. And then, you know, again, capitalism and imperialism, these systems depend upon us being ignorant. They need us to be stupid, you all. It's just a fact. There's no way around. There's no easier way to say it. They need us to be dumb and isolated because what does that do? If you think about it, if you have a, uh, you, you've all seen the meme where it has the big fish, which is presumably like to represent a shark and it's chasing the, the couple of small fish to eat them. And then the second slide shows all the fish united together to form one bigger fish than the shark chasing the shark. So clearly that's just basic mathematics. If there's a few of us isolated, one here, one there, well, then it makes it so much easier for our enemies to hold us at bay and defeat us. And they're able to do that by keeping us ignorant. So if I'm sitting here as an African saying, well, I, ain't, I don't care what happens to them Asian people. They ain't got nothing to do with us. They got them stores in our neighborhood. They, you know, they, 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 they just like the Europeans. And if that's all, they're the only level of consciousness that I'm willing to achieve. Uh, well, the Indians, they talk as bad about us as white people. If that's all that I'm willing to achieve and I'm not willing to challenge myself to learn more, then I'm doing the job of imperialism. I'm doing this job for it because I'm keeping myself in this little silo and we can never advance beyond where we, we are right now with that level of ignorance. I mean, that, how is that working out for us now? The, having ignorance be the dominant thing that's, that's not working out for us, y'all. So, you know, if you look at it, there, as Shakur said, there's no history of victory without solidarity. I mean, if you look at that in some examples, she mentioned were Cuba's role in Africa in the 80s and 90s. We talk about this a lot. We will continue to talk about it. And there's no, uh, there, there, there was no obligation for Cuba, a small Caribbean island country, to have anything to do with Africa other than their international solidarity. And they sent 500,000 troops there that saved Southern Africa from apartheid. The United States didn't do it. The Soviet Union didn't do it. China didn't do it. It was small 11 million country Cuba that did that, that provided that assistance to Angola, Mozambique, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, Zania, South Africa, Namibia. They're the ones who did that. And that's the reason why we... Uh, evaded that, which would have really been a serious setback in Africa had it not been for them. That's a wonderful example of solidarity. And they, they received nothing for that sacrifice. They had 50,000 of their people killed in Africa during that time. They didn't receive anything. They didn't receive any aid. They didn't receive anything. They didn't do it for that. They did it for principled solidarity. Another example is the 1965 Immigration Act, which was pushed through by the organizations Shakur mentioned, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they pushed through that act, pushed Congress to adopt it. And what that act did is it eliminated the quota system in immigration in this country, which had kept in place white supremacy where 90% of the people who immigrated here before 1965 were from Europe. Since the quotas were eliminated, since 1965, 90% of the people that immigrated to this country have been from Asia, Africa, Central, South America, and the Caribbean. So this is an example because these organizations that did this, they didn't, this was not a, a primary topic 
in African or issue in African communities here in the U.S. And that's who those organizations were representative. They just knew it was a question of justice. So they fought for it. So if you have an immigrant family, um, especially if you're not African and you, you're sitting there talking about I'm thankful to the U.S. government for you just you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And that's exactly why political education is important. I mean, that's very disrespectful to my ancestors for you to sit there coming from Asia or wherever you come from talking about you're thankful to the U.S. government for your family having the opportunity to come here. My people shed blood for you to be able to do that in an act of principle solidarity. But if you don't have political education, you don't know that. And so when they come on TV with those dumb commercials, you believe them. So that's why we need to have all of these things in force. So again, you know, if you show me someone who is against principled solidarity, I'm gonna show you someone who's very ignorant and someone who is not involved in the struggle. And by being involved, the only logical definition that can represent that you all is someone who is in an organization engaged in ongoing work for justice. Just because you get on Facebook and say something, that's not, you're not involved in the struggle. That's like saying, if you get on Facebook and say something about nuclear physics, well, you're a nuclear physics physician. If you get on there and say something about LeBron James, well, you're an NBA player. That, that's absurd. That logic is absurd, but for some reason, and everybody knows that doesn't make sense, but for some reason, when it comes to the struggle for justice, Everybody that has a mouth that makes a sound now is an expert and has an opinion that's worth being valued. Now, I don't, there isn't a whole lot that I agree with Malana Karinga about, but one thing he said I do agree with, everybody does not have a right to an opinion. You got to earn that right through work. Okay, so, you know, people all the time are telling me this, and I'm, my first question is, what organization are you in? Well, I'm not one, well, then I don't, I, you know, you don't even believe enough in what you're saying to me to get with people and make it happen. So why do, why do you think I want to listen to that? I don't want to hear that. That's intellectual masturbation. We say that all the time. That's all you're doing. So that has to be the definition. And so principal solidarity, if it's not happening, if you're dealing with someone who doesn't value that, that's because they're not engaged in it. I, I guarantee you, use that formula. Someone's saying, well, nobody comes to us, nobody supports us. That's somebody that ain't doing organized work to organize our people. You will never find somebody doing that who will make an ignorant statement like that because as we said, they learn from the experience. They encounter people, build relationships, they know better, period. They know better. So the ingredients for strong solidarity, again, we have the picture because you know with these, these brutal white supremacist assaults against Asians, these, there's, these Africans were on the internet and they said, well, name one organization that has uh, stood up for African lives and all these, uh, people on there like, I ain't never done, nobody. I ain't never heard it, I ain't seen it. And I said, well, all y'all are saying this because you're not in organizations working for our people. Because if you would, you would know Asians for Black Lives. You would know Yellow Peril. You would know the Red Guard. You would know Anik Bayan. You would know Gabrielle. You would know all these Asian organizations who have been explicit and concrete in their support for African people. But you don't know that because all you're doing is sitting on the internet with, with uh, people with the same idiocy that you practice. So you don't know it. That's why you don't know it. It's just a circle jerk of a bunch of idiots. So this is not, we are not gonna let this uh, uh, masquerade as real political struggle. That's nothing but intellectual masturbation and individualism. And that is the reason why we're in the situation we're in right now. And if that offends you, that can only be because you're a part of that process. And the good news is that you can change and get out of that and start engaging in real work. And that's what we need to get out of this. So the, cre the key ingredients for strong solidarity are that, the, again, the organized political education that counters these backward capitalist narratives. Capitalism works 24-7, 365, you all to confuse you. I have not eaten beef in almost 40 years, but I still know to all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, because McDonald's is relentless in their propaganda. And how are we going to defeat them when we only 
have a message once every two months or whenever you get up and feel like it or whenever you're not high. Or, we're never going to win if, if that's how we come to the struggle. And they're 24-7, 365 coming with their messages. So we got to be willing to do the same thing. And the only way we're going to do that is with that kind of foundation. And then our outreach has to be centered around solidarity. Like you got to be willing to get out, get out of your comfort zone. Like Shakur said, if you all, all your struggle is with people that think like you, you ain't serious. You know, you get, you, because what you're saying, if that's the reality, whether it's intentional or not is irrelevant, but what's happening if that's your reality is that you don't even have the impetus to grow. And if you're not having the impetus to grow, you're not going to grow. And if you're not going to grow, you're no use to us. We need people who are willing to adapt and build because the world is changing and we need to be able to change with it. And in many instances, help shape some of those changes. So that means you got to be willing to get out and get beyond that. And so like Shakura said, yeah, we read Vladimir Lenin. We read Rosa Luxemburg and the APRP. We read all of them. We read Mao Zedong. You don't read Kwame Nkrumah or Sekou Ture or Amil Karker Brawl in your organizations. You don't even know who those people are. You don't know who John Trudell is. You don't know who any of these people are. You don't know who the Means family is. You don't know any of these people. None of these people that are not, you know, coming from your experience. Well, then this is what has to change if we're really going to have victory. No question about that. And so, you know, I'll just say, I'll use us as an example um, because we were talking about the Palestinian struggle, uh, we've been talking about this since the late 60s, early 70s, we were talking about this. I remember in 1984, that Geraldine Ferraro woman re running for president came to the university when I was a student. I had just gotten in the APRP work study circle process. And I was out there, one of the other brothers who had also joined and um, she said the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization and the, uh, um, the ANC, the African National Congress in the Zania South Africa, were terrorist organizations. And we started yelling and heckling, and the, the Secret Service removed us and detained us from there. So, you know, this has always been our position, and as well as our position with the indigenous people. We struggle relentlessly. You know, a lot of Africans are ashamed of being African because we have allowed white supremacy to provide us a narrative of who we are. Your enemy's never going to give you the knowledge and tools to free yourself. But that's what we do. We don't study anything. So all we know about Africa is what they told us. It's, it's poor, it's starving, there's wars there. So we, who wants to be a part of that? So we start lying and making up history. Well, we've always been in the Western Hemisphere. We struggle relentlessly with people spreading that foolishness. Nothing against the indigenous people. They have a proud and wonderful history here, but I don't wanna be indigenous to the Western hemisphere. I love being African. I love everything that manifests my African history and culture. And, and I, I wanna build on that and, and having respect for that is what's led me to have respect for everybody else. So we are an example of that. That's how I was raised. That's how my daughter here, Shakura was raised to study, learn, and respect our culture and our history. And from that, to study, learn, and respect other people's culture. She talked about going to Alcatraz with the American Indian Movement to celebrate on Thanksgiving. She was doing that since she could barely walk. She was doing that. We always had her doing that. And we would explain it to her what it was about. This is not your land. This is the indigenous people's land. But you got a land. You got a wonderful land. And we're going to tell you what it is, and then we're going to take you there. And that's what we did. So we never had big televisions and big furniture in our houses, but our child was in Africa early at four years old and, and multiple times after that. So, you know, this is an example of how that looks when you make these your priority. And our African struggle has benefited from that solidarity that we've shown to other communities. It's made us stronger because we understand the system that we're fighting against and we understand how they're fighting against it and that helps us understand the best ways to attack the system and because we understand that that's how we're going to win that's how we know we're going to win no question about that so we want to wrap up by telling you that you know the same themes will continue like mcdonald's only we're doing it because it's right and it's for justice. And those themes are 
You have got to be in some organization working for justice. You cannot do it by yourself. We will not entrepreneur our way out of oppression. That is not going to happen because this entire capitalist economy is based on exploiting African human and material resources. So just because you get a bigger portion of it, all you're doing is investing in our people's oppression. So that is not the solution. It is the solution for you to get individual money for yourself. So if that's your objective, you're in the wrong place. But if you truly have a desire to do justice for humanity, that is not the solution. The only solution has to be organization on a mass level against these systems of oppression. So we've got to get you to do that. We invite you to join the All African People's Revolutionary Party in the middle of the page to the left. You can do that by going to aprp-intl.org. Many of you are doing that. We appreciate you doing that. Um, if you want to contact Shakura and I, you can go to the site, abetterworld.me. These videos are all always housed there. If you wanna go back and look at them, you can see them there as well as upcoming workshops that we do in this Sunday time slot, that information is there. And I'm also one of the editors for the Hood Communist Collective, hoodcommunist.org. African revolutionaries strongly encourage you to stay connected to that site, wonderful information on there. And please support the other broadcast efforts we have going on. The APRP has the Pantula podcast, from our comrades on the east coast of this plantation, these indigenous people's lands. So you should look up that and support that. We have the Forward Ever podcast coming from our comrades here in Southern California, support that one. Um, we have the weekly APRP New Mexico broadcast from our comrades there at 11 a.m. on Thursdays, Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, noon Eastern Time, support that. And then join us every Sunday, next Sunday, the 25th, we're gonna take the book that I wrote, A Guide for Organizing Defense Against White Supremacist, Patriarchal and Fascist Violence. And we're gonna start breaking down some of the concepts in the event, I'm sorry, in the book for the next couple of weeks. So next week, we're gonna, Shakur and I are gonna talk about organizing in neighborhoods. Like how do you get started? Phase one, what are the first steps you take? Cause we're serious when we say European people, you gotta start organizing your people. You're the only ones that can do that. Uh, the white supremacists of today were the white people that were not organized yesterday. And the white people that are not organized today are going to be the white supremacists of tomorrow. And you were the only people that can stop that from happening. And you're not doing that by coming to marches yelling Black Lives Matter. That's not making that happen. What needs to make that happen is the work we've been talking about for this last hour, that we've been talking about for this last year, that we've been talking about for the last 50 years. That's how that happens. So come out next week for that. Um, get the book, A Guide for Organizing Defense Against White Supremacist, Patriarchal and Fascist Violence. It's only available on Amazon, just like your gasoline is only available at Shell and Chevron. So if you're gonna tell me, well, I don't do Amazon, then tell me how you move your car. If you don't do Shell and Chevron, you do what you need to do to survive. We're African revolutionaries. We do what we need to do to survive. So again, the people that come at us like that, are people that don't understand this work, okay? And then put on your calendar African Liberation Day. May 23rd and 25th, we're having an international webcast. We had about 17,000 people on it last year. We wanna up that this year. So put that on your calendar and we will have that and we look forward to you being there. We hope you can join these other comrades in these podcasts throughout the week and broadcasts and shows. We hope you can come back and join us next week buy the book and come to African Liberation Day. We hope you join some organization working for justice and that you implement a political education program in that organization. And as we always say, we are willing to help you do that. We are willing to help you do that because all we want you all is to be free. Please enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you for joining us. Forward ever, backwards never. We're marching forward to one unified socialist Africa, one unified socialist Africa, smash patriarchy, destroy it, smash patriarchy, smash homophobia, death to capitalism, one unified socialist Africa. Enjoy your Sunday. Have a great rest of your evening.